Judges chapter 1 verse 22 and it reads, Now the tribes of Joseph attacked Bethel and the Lord was with them. And when they sent men to spy out Bethel, formerly called Luz, the spies saw a man coming out of the city and they said to him, show us how to get into the city and we will see that you are treated well. So he showed them and they put the city to the sword, but spared the man and his family. This is the moment we've all been waiting for. Israel is finally stepping into the promise that God made Abraham hundreds of years ago. It's been over 40 years since God brought them out of Egypt and across the Red Sea. And they've literally, as they would say, been chasing their tail in the wilderness, waiting for the moment where God finally lets them go into all that he promised them. They're beginning to clear the land. Verse 26, he then went to the land of the Hittites, where he built a city and called it Luz, which, it, which is its name to this day. Somebody say, but Manasseh. But Manasseh did not drive out the people of Bethshan or Tanakh or Dor or Iblium or Megiddo and their surrounding settlements. For the Canaanites were determined to live in that land. When Israel became strong, they pressed the Canaanites into forced labor, watch this, but never drove them out completely. I have a message for you tonight entitled, Torn Between Here and There torn between here and there. Father God, we declare that we believe your word is true. God, we believe that there's so much that we are able to do through who you are in us. God, we receive every single miracle you have in store for us. God, we refuse to live a normal, natural, average life. God, we are walking in the supernatural. God, anoint me to speak, anoint us to hear. God, we're believing that. Situations are changing as we're sitting in this room, as we're, as we're watching online. We're extending our faith that we're not going home tonight to the same situation that we left. But you are currently working for our good. And we will be ever so careful to give you all the glory, all the honor, and all the praise. In the matchless, mighty name of Jesus, we pray. Come on, somebody shout amen. amen. And amen and amen. The year was 2015. It was August. And we were coming up on our second wedding anniversary. I told my wife, I said, babe, wherever you want to go, Big Daddy got you. <laughs> she said, wherever? I said, wherever. You just pick a place. We're going. Because you're that special to me. This, this was, don't judge me, this was the first vacation of our marriage that I had ever paid for. My dad had gifted us a vacation for our uh, first wedding anniversary, and I didn't know how much it cost. I just said, thank you. <laughs> and we went. This was year two. I was, I was on my own. So I said, babe, pick a spot. We're there. She says, say less. I want to go to Paris. I said, I told you, Big Daddy got you. Look up the plane tickets. She looks up the plane tickets. I said, babe, you know, we're just starting off on our journey. One day I'll fly you to Paris first class, but 
but we can't fly first class this time. She said, babe, that's not first class. That's the price for coach. I said, as much as I would love to take you to Paris, don't you think that's like a 10th year anniversary trip? I, I think it's a bit much. Let's, let's try somewhere else. A little closer to home. <laughs> like DC. <laughs> She said, she said, I heard Cabo is nice this time of year. I said, Cabo, okay. Where is that? She said, it's Mexico. It's the south of here. I said, okay. South is better than across the ocean. Let's try south. And pulls up plane tickets. And I said, don't play with me first class. We're in the back of the plane. We just will party when we get there. So she showed me a ticket. I said, okay, we can do that. We can do that. All right, let's go to Cabo. Find a hotel. <laughs> Pulls up a couple hotels. Shows me the price. I said, no, not Cabo. Not Cabo. Not Cabo. That, that's like a fifth year deal. But we're getting warmer. Let's try Cancun. It's closer. Look at the plane ticket. Look at the hotel. We can do that. We just won't be able to eat. Once we get there, finally land on Puerto Rico. You don't need a passport for Puerto Rico. That. You almost could swim. It's a lot. Southwest flies to Puerto Rico. We, we can listen. We got our tickets. We, we were like E94 boarding the plane. If you ever flown Southwest, you would know there's no E. It's A, B, C, or D. That's it. We finally get on a plane at the end, and, and we book our hotel. And, and, and I mean, I was shocked that there was a hotel that nice for that price. We should have started with Puerto Rico. We land at the airport and said, babe, we should get a car. I said, well, you see the way my account's set up right now. Before I left, I didn't get to move the cash from the check-in to the savings. So let's just take a taxi. We can walk. I mean, we just want to experience Puerto Rico. So we take a taxi to what we thought was our hotel. And when he pulled up, <laughs> you ever been like punked, catfished, hustled? I'm pretty sure when they were posting pictures of the hotel, they took pictures of the hotel across the street and then posted it as here's where you are going. Because it looked, I'm trying to think of a city that I can mention that won't offend somebody in the room. If we offend somebody online, it's okay, but I don't want anybody to punch you. It looked like we landed, y'all, in like Fayetteville, North Carolina. <sighs> At le if you're from Fayetteville, I'm sure it's a lovely place, but... <laughs> The hotel looked like a Motel 4. There's no such thing as a Motel 4. I know, I think it used to be a 6, but it lost 2. So now it's just a 4. <laughs> we were there for 4 days, y'all. I have never not slept more in my life. We, but, okay, y'all ain't gonna judge us, right? but we had to get a picture for Instagram. <laughs> True story. So we snuck to the hotel across the... <laughs> I never said in the picture, this is where we were staying. I just said, wow, look how beautiful Puerto Rico is. 
Click send. Have you ever been in a position where you were anticipating something, excited about it, couldn't wait for it to happen? Maybe it was a restaurant. Maybe it was a vacation. Maybe it was getting out of college. Maybe it was getting married or having your first kid, owning your own home. But this has been like a man, when this happens, oh, it's going to be amazing. And then you finally get there. And let's just say before you can take a picture, you got to walk across the street. You're like, this, this, (laughs) am I the only one? This is not quite what I thought being an adult would be. Anybody? When I was 16 and my mama said, well, when you're an adult, you can do your own thing. And I said, I can't wait. The emphasis in which I said, I can't wait, I imagined something different than what adulting actually... (laughs) Somebody says a little ghetto here. That's where Israel found themselves. That for 40 years they were hearing about this promised land. This land that was flowing with milk and honey. This land where God said, you will lack nothing. Everything you need will be taken care of. Two and a half years, they marched to the edge of their promise. And because they didn't believe God, they could not go in. And they sat there for 37 and a half years, waiting for the people with no faith to die off. Can I I mess with you? One of the problems with God is he lives outside of time. So he said, I'll wait. I'm in no rush. Whenever your faith catches up to what I said will happen, we can go on in. Some of us feel like we're waiting on God. Can I help you? You ain't never waiting on God. He said, before the time began, I already knew what was going to happen. I said my yes, I'm waiting on your amen. And they finally cross over into promised land. And what's really messed up is Manasseh was one of the last tribes to get to their land. So they get in and Judah sees their land and Judah's like, whoa! It's just what God promised me. Ephraim gets in and he's like, wow! Look at this! It's better than I... Come on, anybody remember Christmas? When your siblings were opening gifts and their gifts were like lit. And you were just excited because you're like, oh, if they got that, if you got that with your bad self, if not, and then you open yours, wow, pajamas, how'd you know? And you kind of got a fake, like. I'm grateful because, you know, gratitude is the doorway to supernatural. So, (laughs) thanks. Manasseh gets to their promise, and their promise got an army in it. And their promise got a people that say, hey, you can move in, but we ain't moving out. And they said, well, you got to leave because God said this belongs to me. And they said, well, we don't believe in your God. I don't care what your God says. They said, let's fight for it, Canaan. And they said, well, we were waiting for that. And after seven days, Manasseh said, y'all can stay. (laughs) And here am I in the promise that God made me. But it doesn't quite look the way that I thought it was going to look. Hear me, I came tonight to speak to some Christians that, if you were to be honest, you would say... 
I'm not where I used to be, but I'm not where I thought I'd be. I'm, 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 not, I'm not in the bondage that he rescued me from. But if I were to keep it real, I can't say that I'm in the freedom that I hoped I would be in. I'm, I, I, I'm not in the place where I, I, I'm, I'm leading my own life and making it up and kind of just living any which way, but, but I'm not necessarily in the place where I'm sure where I'm going is what God called me to be. I feel like I'm just stuck between here and, and there. To, to know why Manasseh wasn't able to take hold of all that God had for them, you, you've got to know the story of Manasseh. Manasseh was actually the grandchild of Jacob. Jacob had 12 sons or 11 sons. His second to his last son was by the name of Joseph. Remember, Joseph is the one that his brother sold into slavery and he went in Egypt and he actually, actually saved the entire people out of a famine. And then when he brought his father Jacob and all the siblings, Jacob said, wow, Joseph, look what God has done. Joseph, I'm so grateful. I'm going to adopt your sons, which are my grandsons, as my own sons. And they're going to get an inheritance just like their uncle's. So Joseph's two sons, Manasseh and Ephraim, they were the grandchildren of Jacob, but they were getting an inheritance like brothers. So here it is, all of Israel, who many people believe was close to 3 million people, marched through the wilderness. They come to the Jordan River. They park there for 37 and a half years. Finally, God says, it's time to go over. And the tribes begin to go over. The only problem is there were three tribes that got comfortable waiting. There were three tribes that got tired of God not doing what he said he was going to do when they thought he should do it. So, I'm having fun, y'all having fun? So they said, this relationship is good enough. I'm not going to wait for what God promised me. They got all their teeth. I've got good credit, so I'm not worried about theirs. We gonna be all right. They they said, this job is good enough. I'm not living in abundance, but I can make the bills. I'm good here. What, What you may not know, those are the tribes of Gad, Reuben, and the tribe of Manasseh. And in the tribe of Manasseh, when they said, we're not going over, this is good enough, hear me, a civil war broke out. Because half the tribe said, this is not good enough. I refuse to settle for good. I will only settle for what God promised me. The other half said, I don't know if the promise is going to come to pass. I do know that this looks good enough. I'm settling here. And what happened was there ended up being a split of a tribe. Half the tribe said, I'm settling. Half the tribe said, we're going over. And they said, I'll see you when I see you. Don't let the door hit you. We're the good Lord. One of the problems with us as believers is we want the promise of God and all of our friends too. I'm sorry. I've been on vacation for four weeks, so I have just came back a little cranky. One of the problems is we want the promise of God and all of our family to understand our decisions. One of the problems is we want the promise of God and everybody else to think that we've got it all going on. And God says, you've got to decide, are you going to stay with the pack and settle? Or are you going to step into all that I have for you and refuse to settle for good enough? I'm just crazy enough to think that at Union Church on a rainy Friday night in what we call Catalyst, there's a couple hundred people in this room that said, as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. It doesn't matter who's coming with me. It doesn't matter who talks about me. It doesn't matter who understands me. I refuse to settle 
hell for good. And one of the pro- one of the problems with being frustrated with good enough is some of you, your good is somebody else's miracle. So you've got people that would kill to be where you are. You're like, I'm not ungrateful. This just ain't it. This. Am I the only one? Who do you think you are? You're doing better than anybody in your family has ever done. And I'm grateful. But I don't think he brought me this far. I don't think he brought me this close to be able to see the promise and not take me the rest of the way. For, for all the people who are going over the river, you just wait, I ain't talking to you for a second. But there's a couple of you in this room that you've been tired with your journey, you've been exhausted, you've been overwhelmed, you've been tired of fighting, and you are getting ready to settle for what you know is beneath what God called you. Hear me, don't you dare stop, don't you dare quit, don't you dare give up, don't you dare say this is good enough, don't you dare say I'm doing better than everybody else that I I know, so I must. Don't you settle on the east side of the Jordan when there's a promise. On you've come this far. You look at somebody. They say you might as well finish the race. Come on, you might as well finish. If you were gonna quit, you should have done it before you put your shoes on. If, if you were going to quit, anybody ever run a marathon? Yeah, me neither. But <laughs> you know the best time to quit? Before you start? You know the best time to get a divorce? Before you say, I do. You come this far, you might, there's a promise on the other side of this. But what Manasseh found out is because half of me is over on that side and half of me is on this side, I'm too weak to take hold of all that God has for me. Three quick thoughts, three quick thoughts. Can I give you one? First thought is this, there's a war waging within all of us. There's a war that is waging within all of us. Hear me, Manasseh was born equally between a problem and a promise. The day of Manasseh's birth, he was split between a problem and a promise. The name Manasseh means to forget. Or God has made me forget. Can I prophesy over you for a second? God is getting ready to do something in your life that will cause you to have amnesia of the pain that you are going through right now. God is getting ready to do something in your life that will so blow your mind, you will forget how long you've been waiting. You will forget how long you've been fighting. You will forget how much pain you are in. God is getting ready to do something in your life that births a Manasseh. Wait, what pit? What prison? What lies? I don't even remember what I've been through. So miraculous is where I am, right? Just understand, we serve a God that will owe no man. He said, just trust me. Everything that you're going through. You ever ever remembered your testimony or someone told you your testimony and it felt like somebody else's testimony because you don't even remember that season of your life. You, you know you were crying yourself to sleep at night, but, but there's such an emotional disconnection from that moment because your joy is at a level that you couldn't comprehend and, and the presence of God in your life is at a place that, is there anybody in this room that can say, he's already done that. He, he's already moved in my life in a way that I've, I've forgotten. 
Joseph here holding his baby boy, saying, you are the miracle that has caused me to forget all the pain that I've been through. And then Joseph handed his baby boy to his wife and Manasseh's mother, Asenath. I don't know if I said that right, but that's all right, because she was a witch, so I don't have to... No, no, I'm serious. Manasseh's mama was not a follower of God. She was a daughter of the priest of On. On was the city of Ra. Idolatry. So here it is, Manasseh, born to a father that walked in the promises of God, but also born to a mother that despised God. His nature and his DNA were the promises of God. But his nurture was anti-God. Everything in his bloodline said, I am the called of God. But everything he was raised to believe was, I am by myself. What a lot of people do not realize is there is a war that is going on in each and every one of us between our nature and our nurture. You see, your daddy is where you get your last name. But your mama's where your nurturing comes from, where your affection and emotions and relating with people. And my last name says I'm this, but my upbringing has made me. The Bible says this in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 17. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old has passed away. Behold, all things have become new. The Bible says that the second that you enter into the kingdom of God, Columbia, that you are made not a better person, but a new. Look at somebody next to I'm not the same person. I'm not the same person. I'm, I'm, not, I'm not who I used to be. I've been given a new nature, a godly nature. Somebody say amen. amen. My nature is divine. But I've been through some situations in my life that have caused me to believe I'm not as divine as I thought I was. I've had some setbacks and I've had some pain and I've had some experiences and and, and I've had some situations where where, where it's taught me that I'm kind of all that I've got. It's me against the world and without even realizing it, there's this war on the inside of me between who God says I am and who life says I am. Paul said it this way in Romans chapter 7, verse 15. I don't understand myself. For I really want to do what is right, but I can't. And I don't want to do, that's what I do, and that's what I hate. Can you relate? Anybody can ever relate to, I want to feel invincible. I want to feel like if God before me, it doesn't matter who is against me. But when I walk into that office, when I walk into that room, when I see that person, for some reason, I just don't feel like I have what it takes. I I want to, but I don't. There's a war that is going on in the inside of me right this time. It's time to engage in the battle. It's time to engage in the battle. On June 21st, 1861, it was the first battle of Bull Run. The first battle of the Civil War in the United States of America. It was also nicknamed the Picnic Battle. Because hundreds of families packed picnic baskets. And went out to the battle with their wives and their children to view what they assumed would be a very quick victory. There are Congress people and senators that were sitting up on the hill in their Sunday best to watch this very quick massacre, only to find out 
it wasn't going to be as quick as they thought it was going to be. When, when bullets started to pierce through their picnic baskets, when, when they began to see soldiers running towards them instead of away from them and realize what was supposed to be a quick union battle was actually an extended union defeat, they were blown away because they didn't take the battle seriously. As the Bible says in 1 Timothy chapter 6, verse 12, fight the good fight of faith. Lay hold on eternal life to which you were also called and have confessed the good confession in the presence of many witnesses. Here's what I've discovered. A lot of believers don't wake up in the morning ready to fight. A lot of believers wake up in the morning ready to do life, but they don't wake up ready to fight. And it's because they don't understand that there's a battle that is going on in the inside of them at all times. A battle between who God tells me that I am and a battle in who life has nurtured me to be. Paul is telling the church, you've got to make a decision. You've got to wake up every day ready to fight the fight of faith. First Corinthians chapter nine, verse 27. Rather, I'm landing punches on my own body and subduing it like a slave. I do this to be sure that I myself won't be disqualified after preaching to others. Here's what Paul said. He said, I could be a Christian that tells other people how great God is, but never experiences it in myself. Where's my connect group leaders? My dream team leaders. Come on now. If I'm not careful, Paul said, I can point to a God that I'm not actually experiencing my... So he said, 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 I'm going to fight myself. I'm, I'm going to beat my body into submission because Paul understood there's a war that is going on in the inside of me. And the second I ignore it is the second that I've lost it. What's the war? Between who God says I am and between who life has told me I am. Between walking in my own strength and walking in the power of the Holy Spirit. Genesis 1-2 says this, the earth was without form and void and darkness was on the face of the deep. Watch this. And the Spirit of God was hovering over the face of the water. Sean, you come play. Here's the whole battle. The Bible says the same power that raised Christ from the dead dwells on the inside of me. The only problem is there's a carnal nature of me that quelches the Holy Spirit in me. And keeps him from producing what he was designed to produce in my life. It is the Holy Spirit that created everything that you see upon the words of God. It says the Holy Spirit hovered over the expanse of the nothingness. And God said, let there be light. And the Holy Spirit threw up the light. And, and God said, let there be sun and let there be moon. And he hovered over what was not to create what God said should be. You know the Holy Spirit is hovering over your life to create everything that God said should be in your life. The problem is that when your flesh says, no, 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 we're not going with what the Holy Spirit says. We're going with what I say. Holy Spirit says, I can't produce. So here's the whole fight. Every morning I wake up and I say, flesh, you're not going to dictate my life today. I'm dictated by the Holy Spirit. My words are dictated by the Holy Spirit. My thoughts are dictated by the Holy Spirit. My actions are dictated by the Holy Spirit. My decisions are dictated by the Holy Spirit. 2 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 4 says this, For the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but mighty in God for the pulling down of strongholds. Watch this. Casting every argument and every high thing that exalts itself against the knowledge of God. Watch this. Bringing every into captivity to the obedience of Christ. Here's what that wrestle looks like. Somebody says something you don't like. I'm going to give them a piece of my... (laughs) 
Holy Spirit, should I give them a piece of my mind? No, because you can't curse them without cursing yourself. Y'all never heard that before? The Bible says that cursing poisons the one that it. You wake up and you see a problem. You're like, I got to go fix this. Holy Spirit, should I? Holy Spirit says, no, it's not by might nor by power. It's by. Our wrestle is I'm going to live every day running my life through the filter of Holy Spirit, is this you? And as I do this, he begins to create all that he said he was going to do. Write this down. We're going to end. You're destined for the promise no matter what. Anybody love God's word? No, like for real. Like, like I love, I love God's word. So here it is, Manasseh. Split. Goes into their promise. Can't drive the Canaanites out. So guess what they do? They just live there with them next door. You ever went to bed with your kids in the bed? Wake up at one in the morning, just got a foot in your face. And you're just like, this just can't be. But they promised me. <laughs> for five years, they live with the Canaanites. For 10, for 20, for 30, for 40, for 50, for... For 100 years, they can never drive them out. All the way till we get to Judges chapter 6, they had actually taken over all of Israel now. The Bible says in verse 14 of Judges chapter 6, the Lord turned to him and said, go in the strength you have and save Israel out of Midian's hand. Am I not sending you? God said, it's time to drive them out. Pardon me, Lord. Watch this. Gideon. Y'all ever heard of Gideon? Replied. But how can I save Israel? Watch this. For my clan is the weakest. Where? In that half tribe of Manasseh. And I am the least in my family. The Lord answered, I will be with you. And you will strike down all the Midianites, leaving none alive. Somebody say nature versus nurture. Versus nurture. At this point, Israel was completely invaded. God said, enough is enough. When I said, I promise you, Canaan, I didn't say half of it. I didn't say you get to move in, but everybody else gets to stay. God said, when I promised you life and life more abundantly, I didn't say sin would leave, but depression would stay. I said life and life more abundantly. Enough is enough. Get up and drive out who I told you to drive out. But Gideon had been nurtured in his tribe. We're too weak. And we're of the weakest clan and the weakest family. God, you don't understand. I come from a lineage of settling. This is about as good as it's going to get. And God said, you missed it. You think you couldn't drive Canaan out because you were too weak. But you never realized it was never about your might or your strength. But it was all about your assurance that I'm the one that fights your battle for you. He said, don't worry about who's not with you. Don't worry about the army that you don't have. Just worry about the God that you do have. Union Church, God sent me tonight to let you know that for a lot of us, he is looking to do miracles in our lives. And when he tells us, all we've done is respond by, you can't do that. I don't have a degree. I don't know the right person. I don't have the right connection. I'm too old. I'm too young. I've missed this opportunity. I've missed that opportunity. In other words, God, I'm of the tribe of Manasseh, of the smallest clan and the smallest family. And God sent me to tell you, don't you think I knew your story? 
before I called you and anointed you and prepared you and opened a promise for you. I don't need you strong. I need you trusting. I don't need you to have it all figured out. I just need you to say, if God be for me, it does not matter who's against me. I don't need you to have a five-year plan. I just need you to say, if he said it in his word, it will come to pass in my what is it that you surrendered that God promised you? He said, I'm not strong enough. I'm not connected enough. I'm not holy enough. I'm not whatever enough. God sent me to let you know tonight he is. Hop up on your feet. Matthew 17, 19 says this. Then the disciples came to Jesus privately and said, why could we not cast it out? Jesus said to them, well, because you, you, you're unbelief. For surely I say to you, if you have faith as a, you will say to this mountain, move. Because I'm torn between Here and there, and it will be moved, and nothing will be impossible for you. What have you not been saying? Because you just don't see how it's going to happen. What have you not been saying because you know you don't have the resources for it? What have you not been saying because you've told yourself that you're too old, too young, too far gone in this or that? God says you need this much faith, this much assurance that I'm going to do what I said I'm going to do in your life. Come on, right where you are. Can you just take about 15 seconds? Can you lift your hands? And just let the Spirit of God minister to you. I believe in this moment, God's specifically showing you areas that, that's good, but now I've got more. This isn't quite what I promised you. And it's amazing, as soon as that thought comes to our mind, the first thought is how powerless we are, God, but I can't control them. But God, I can't make it happen. If, if I could, I would. God, I, I'm at the end of my strength. And he said, great, because I'm at the beginning of mine. I didn't ask you to fix it. I didn't ask you to make it happen. I just asked you to say out your mouth with faith. This mountain is going to move. He said, if you believe it, it'll take place. What are we singing? Like nothing's impossible. We're going to sing this for about 60 seconds, Columbia. And what I want you to do is just take a moment and figure out which side of the Jordan am I, am I on? Am I the half tribe that says this is good enough? I'm not pushing across. And I'll be honest with you, all of us have areas in our life where we've just said, I, I don't want the fight. I don't want the trouble. I don't want the drama. I'm going to settle right here. And we've got to repent for settling for less than God promised us. Come on, singing nothing.
fear nothing. I believe, and I, I believe, you're my healer, and I believe, you're my portion, and I believe, say so you're, you're my, my portion, portion. and I Since this, the second that I walked in the room tonight, and just hear me, this is a moment of demarcation. This is a line in the sand. As a church, a defining moment in your life, this is a moment where everything can change. But I'm gonna be honest with you, it depends on how you respond. So what we need is first your response. And I promise you, you're going to see heaven's response. I'm going to give an altar call. And that is a move out of your seat and come up front. And that's for those of you that if you would be honest, you would say, I've been divided. I've been picking and choosing my surrender. I've been picking and choosing. Sometimes I'm believing the word of God over my life, but sometimes I'm going to believe. Don't move. Don't worry about the chairs. Don't worry about the chairs. Just keep the moment sacred. I've been picking and choosing what God says about me and what I say about me, what, what I want my future to be and what his future is for me. I, if I'd be honest with you, I've been a little bit scared because I don't know if I'm going to like where he takes me hey he made you he formed you come on control freak he said I know the plans that I have for you and they're only good they're only to prosper they're not to harm but we can't both hold this steering wheel I'm not giving you a one two three if that's you come 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 I'm 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 making the decision this is full surrender. And when you get down here and pack in as tight as you can so people can make room, when you get down here, don't wait for instructions. Just lift your hands and just let your father know, this is my surrender. I'm done fighting. I'm done wrestling. I'm, I'm done going back and forth. I'm done, depending on the crowd I'm in, dictates who I am. As for me and my house, we are making a decision. We belong to you. You're more than enough for me. Jesus, you said, I believe you're my healer. I believe you are all I need. Come on at Columbia. 
here at BWI. Lord, I Said, I believe you're my portion. I believe you're more than enough for me. Pause. Hey, y'all, look at me for a second. Sometimes we sing things that we don't even know that we're singing. You know what it means to say, you're my portion? It means I'm lacking nothing. Everything that I need, I already have. I hear the Spirit of the Lord saying, stop telling him and stop telling yourself what you're missing out on. If only I had somebody to have my back. If only this, if only that. He said, don't you know I am your portion. I am more than you need to walk into every promise and every victory and everything that, come on, sing it with faith. I believe Father God, I decree and declare over every single person or the sound of my voice that every word that is opposite of your promises is broken in the name of Jesus. Every spirit of rejection that rested when somebody walked out, every fear, every ill-spoken word, every you'll never amount to, and, and this is all that we are, and this is who we are, we break it in the name of Jesus. And we declare every promise is yes and amen. All your promises are yes and amen. Cora maia se na maia na maia na 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 Come on just as God's presence minister to you right where you are Come on, just let his presence speak to you. It's in his presence that there's a reminder of who he made you to be. Jesus, you're all I need. Oh, 
I just hear the Spirit of the Lord saying, you've believed that lie long enough. Now believe what I say about you. That you're blessed and not cursed. That you're above and not beneath. That you're the head and not the tail. That if I be for you, it does not matter what situation is against you. I believe you're my healer. And I believe you are all I Come on, sing it as your prayer. You're my portion. And I believe you're my portion. And I believe you're more than enough for me. Jesus, you're all I need. You're all I need and more. You're all I need and more. All I need and more. You're all I need and more. You're all I need and more. All I need. You're all I need and more. The Lord told Gideon, you're not too small, you're not too significant because I am with you and because I'm with you, victory is guaranteed. Jesus said that he's given us his Holy Spirit as confirmation that he is with us. And now that we've surrendered, God said he's pouring out a fresh portion, a fresh outpouring of his presence, of his Holy Spirit. That that tangible presence of God that you're sensing right now is his confirmation that you may leave this room, but you're not leaving his presence. That tangible sense of his Holy Spirit is God's confirmation that you're not walking away from this altar by yourself, but you're walking away with the same power that that raised Christ from the dead and it quickens your mortal body right where you're standing all over the room can you lift your hands and in your own way just say Holy Spirit fill me afresh fill me with your presence fill me with your power fill me with an overflow the same power that raised Christ from the dead is quickening is awakening is stirring my mortal body right now
So fill me up till I overflow. I wanna know. Come on, make that your prayer tonight. Fill me up. Fill me up till I overflow. I wanna run over. Come on, one more time. Fill me. Fill me up. Till I overflow. I wanna run over. I wanna run over. Fill me up. Till I overflow. I wanna run over. I wanna run over. Come on, just receive all that God has from you from the front of the room to the back of the room. Doesn't matter where you're standing, the presence of God is here. Whether you're watching online, whether you're in Columbia, whether you're in Charlotte, wherever you find yourself, come on, just lift your hands and just let God know I want all of you. Fill me to overflowing. Fill me to overflowing. Fill me to overflow. I want more of you. 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 King Jesus, you're the name we lift it high. Your glory, shake it. believe you're speaking you're working it out for my good you're working it out for my good you're working it out for my good hallelujah I'm gonna get ready to let you go look at me look at me look at me look at me hey there's no reason for you to settle There's no reason for you to say, this isn't what he promised me, but this is good enough. If it were up to you, based on the resources that you have, it makes sense to settle. But when you realize greater is he that is in me than anything that I can face, you know, I, somebody said, I won't settle. I, So here's the fight that you're going home to. And every morning you wake up to fight this fight, it gets easier and easier and easier. That the part of me that says I'm not who God says I am, I'm putting that to death. And the part of me that says I'm a son, I'm a daughter, I'm a co-heir with Christ, I've got the power of the Holy Spirit inside of me and he is before me and behind me and all around me. That is the strength and that is the faith and that is the understanding that I'm walking in every single day of my life. And hear me, you will see the goodness of the Lord in the land of the living. If you believe it, somebody shout amen in this place. Somebody shout amen in this place. Father God.
Father God, we thank you and we're grateful that you are going before us, God. We know that signs, wonders, and miracles await us every single day of our lives. And we'll be ever so careful to give you all the glory and all the honor and all the praise. In the matchless name of Jesus, we pray. Amen and amen and amen.